Hello everyone. Today's demo we're going to be showing how you can easily generate heat maps from your point feature data using simple GIS. To begin with, I have a simple GIS project that I've created and loaded. And in this project you can see I have some shape layers loaded, one of them being the state boundaries for the US. And then the other feature that I have loaded is a point shape file of US cities. And this particular point shape file represents cities and towns across the U.S. In addition, it has a field within it with the population value for that city or town. And if I click on the view feature data and select a point, you can see it here in this population field along with the name of the city. So to begin with, let's assume I wanted to generate a heat map based upon these population values in these towns and cities uh, for the U.S. to kind of see uh, the concentration or the population density across the U.S. So in this case, I'm simply going to go to my geo processing menu. And as I select this menu, I'm going to see in the drop down towards the very bottom, I have a couple of options. I have one that says generate kernel heat map and one that says generate interpolative map. And both of these create uh, heat maps, but the algorithms used by either one is a little different. The first one, the kernel heat map, uses a kernel density probability function to generate a heat map based upon the input point features. And this is best suited for events that you don't expect to find everywhere across your map extent. So for instance, in population, there are certain areas where you would expect to perhaps not have any population values or very small population values. So obviously out in the seas and possibly in, in inhabitable regions. Conversely, the interpolative map uses an inverse distance weighting algorithm and it's best suited to generate heat maps for events where you would expect to have events or measurements in each cell or region of your uh, map extent. For instance, temperature data would be a good example. So in this case, I'm going to use the kernel heat map function. And as I select that menu option, a new dialog box appears. And as I can read here in the description, um, it tells me that it's going to be based upon a kernel density function. And the output values are in number of events in the cell. And of course, you can consult the simple GIS help documentation that comes with the application if you want to see the details of the calculation. In this case, it gives me the list of point layers in my existing map, and I'm going to select the U.S. population layer. And it's saying that I have less than two features selected in the current layer, and so it's going to calculate the heat map based upon the entire feature population. And so if I had wanted to, I could have pre-selected certain features out of my point layer, and it would have only uh, based the heat map on those selected features. So in this case, I did not make a pre-selection, so it's simply going to uh, use all of the features in the current point layer to generate the heat map. Now, it has now selected all the features in my point layer, so if I move this dialog box over, I can actually see on my map that in fact all of the point features are selected. In addition, it defaults some other parameters, for instance the raster width and raster height is simply the width and height of the uh, raster image for the heat map in pixels and correspondingly the cell width and cell height uh, gives the width and height of each pixel value in map units. And of course I could make my raster image uh, wider or taller um, and it just generates a more higher resolution image if I so choose. I also have a search distance parameter and this is the uh, area of influence or the distance of influence for each point feature calculated off of the uh, layer I selected and it uses a standard distance uh, calculation to recommend a search distance and what this means in a kernel density function. Uh, the point values actually have the higher influence at the center of the point and as I move away from that uh, point center um, the influence of that point decreases until it gets to this search distance at which point that uh, point feature has no further influence beyond that distance. 
And so that's just a recommendation based upon the layer. In addition, I can select a weight field for each point feature. So in this case, I'm going to choose population since that represents uh, the population uh, for the towns in my point features. And I can also select a gradient color for my resulting uh, image that will be created. So I can select a uh, starting color, which is the color that will be used for the least dense cell values. And then I can select a ending color, which will be the color used for the highest density cell values. And then uh, simple GIS will just use that to build a color gradient uh, from those starting and ending points. Now I need to choose a uh, output for my new raster image. So it's going to output as a TIFF image. And in this case, I already have a TIFF image I created earlier, and I'm just going to overwrite it, so I selected it. But you just select the folder and give it a file name for the TIFF image you want to create. And when you click OK, um, it'll generate your heat map image and add it to your map document. And as we can see here, we now have this heat map loaded into our map document. Of course, it kind of uh, loaded on top of our other layers, so it's kind of hiding the uh, boundary information underneath. But from this, I can see the deep red indicates the highest population densities in the U.S., which makes sense. We see um, our highest densities around the New York and Southern California area. And then we also have some other uh, fairly dense areas around Chicago, and then of course around the Dallas and Houston areas in Texas. I can make this a little more uh, easier to see if I change the transparency on my layer. So if I just double click on the layer, go to the layer properties and change the opacity value, now I can see my uh, state boundaries uh, show underneath, and then I also see my town points and I can see again uh, the heat map or the highest density areas as represented by the deep red shading. So I'm going to remove this heat map we just created for now to just go over some other parameters we can set. So I'm going to go back to my geoprocessing menu, go back to the kernel heat map, select my US population layer again, and now I wanted to show you the effects if we change this search distance parameter. So like I said, this is the area of influence for each point. So if I was to increase this value, and we'll just put it to 350,000 in this case, and go ahead and reselect my weight field and set my starting and ending color gradient again. And again, I'm just going to overwrite the heat map we created previously. Now when I click apply and it calculates the heat map and adds it to my map view document, I can see that the shading has increased uh, the range of the shading. So it's gotten broader um, because again each point now has a greater uh, area of influence. And so in effect it just made our uh, heat map uh, broader so to speak. And conversely, uh, let's go in, and I actually chose the wrong layer here, so let me reselect our U.S. populations. So conversely, if I was to go in and put in a smaller search distance, so in this case I'm going to put 75,000, and we'll go ahead and set our color gradient again. And we'll just overwrite our TIFF image once more. I can see now that my population density shading has become much more uh, concise or, or defined. And in fact, I see a lot of cases here now where I'm showing no population, um, and which may be accurate. Uh, based upon that area cover, or at least very little population in those areas. And again, I can set my transparency so I can kind of see um, the state borders uh, 
kind of show through the heat map so I can have a better idea of the area I'm looking at. And so a lot of these areas where it's showing no population density or um, very little um, probably are your more uh, rural areas or uh, more inhabitable areas maybe in the upper uh, mountainous regions and desert regions. So again, uh, let's remove this heat map and we'll go through a couple of other options that we have with it. So once again, we'll go to the geoprocessing menu and we'll select our population and in this case, let's show you when we increase the width and height of our resulting raster image. If I increase one of these parameters, by default, it will increase the other parameter because it's going to preserve the aspect ratio of our raster image. But as I've increased the raster width, I also see that the cell width and cell height values decrease because in this case, each pixel covers a smaller uh, region in terms of map units. So what we're doing is building a higher resolution image. And so I'm going to leave the default search distance that was calculated, a simple GIS, and I'll choose my same gradient colors and overwrite our TIFF file once more. And now, as my resulting heat map is added, at, the, at this scale, you probably can't tell much difference, but if I was to zoom in and compare this image versus the one we created before, as you can kind of see, the individual cells start appearing. In this case, they are much finer resolution than they would have been if we just zoomed in on the same area on the heat map we originally created. They had the smaller dimensions. So that just gives you an idea of how you can control the resolution of your uh, resulting heat map. And now let's do something a little different. And I have another point layer that I've loaded here. And what it has is basically uh, temperature measurements for different areas across the US. And of course, this particular point feature that I have is much less dense than the one I was using for our population. So it will impact our results somewhat. But I want to use these temperature measurements to uh, demonstrate the interpolative heat map that uses the inverse distance weighting formula versus the kernel density heat map that we have been using for our population values. So like I said, uh, using the inverse distance weighting formula, it's actually going to calculate a value for every cell covered by our map extent. So in this case, I'm going to go back to our geoprocessing menu and go all the way to the bottom to where I see Generate Interpolative Map. And when I click on this menu option, I get a dialog box similar to the one I had before with just a few differences. And I can see the description has changed so that this function is calculating an interpolative heat map based upon the uh, point features using an inverse distance weighting. But again, I have a raster width and raster height uh, cell values that I can change if I wish. And again, it calculates the actual map unit dimensions for each cell width and height. But now I have a new parameter. Instead of a search distance, I have this distance coefficient parameter. And this really defines how granular uh, our heat map will be. So by default, this parameter is set to 3. And again, I'm going to select a weight field for each of our point features, which in this case, when I click on this drop down box, I'm going to select the temperature field. And again, I need to select a color gradient for our heat map, so I'm going to choose a little bit different gradient at this point in time. And just like before, I also need to choose a new file name. Now when I click apply, I have this new heat map that's been generated and added. And so as I see, uh, the extent of this heat map matches the extent of our point feature layer based upon the selected features. 
and in this case every pixel or cell value has a color value and again I'm going to change my uh, transparency for my layer so I can see the underneath uh, state boundaries and I can kind of see uh, how it has interpreted the temperature data from the point feature uh, we've given it and interpreted uh, values for each pixel or cell within our raster image. And so, uh, again, this is useful if you have uh, point data that represents measurements that you expect to find everywhere within your map extent. So again, if just to show you a couple of the other effects, if I was to go back and reselect our temperature data, and if we change this distance coefficient and made it smaller, it acts much the same way as our kernel heat map did when we made the search distance parameter smaller. So in this case, the actual point feature data is much more localized and its area of influence is decreased. And so we can kind of see these, these rings here on our heat map kind of centered around those actual point feature measurements. So that distance coefficient parameter you can adjust and uh, you can see the different effects with it much like when you adjust the search distance parameter for the kernel density heat map function. So just to show you the difference if we was to select this same data and now increase our distance coefficient. So in this case we're saying that each point has a greater influence for the area around it. We'll export out to a new raster image again. And so now we can see the impact of that as well. And so each point feature has a greater area of influence in the area surrounding that point feature. So this concludes our demo for today. Uh, again, this is just kind of an introduction to how you can use Simple GIS to generate heat maps. If you'd like more information uh, regarding the specific calculations, uh, I would suggest consulting the help documentation that comes with the Simple GIS application. Or visit our website at www.simplegissoftware.com. Thank you.